on today's episode of Life Embodied. So many people come and they have an improvement in their condition relatively quickly, or something is changing, and then it comes again, and it requires more, sometimes even more investment. It tells you, look, it was better, but it's not yet over. You know, it's a bit like an angry friend. It tells you, yeah, it's okay, but I'm still angry with you a little bit. Come soon back, please. Or come to my birthday, next time don't forget, you know, this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That's what the body is constantly doing. It's a bit like a child, but a genius, genius, genius child. Welcome to Life Embodied, where we explore how an embodiment practice can support us in meeting the challenges of life. How can we surf the waves of life deeply anchored in the safety of our bodies? How can we learn to trust our capacity to be with intense sensations and emotions? How can we cultivate body awareness and why does it matter? Episodes include interviews with experts and practitioners that bring their knowledge and passion and share practical tips for your everyday life. I am your host, Katharina Alf. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the conversation. Welcome, everybody. Today's guest is my mentor, colleague, and friend, Elam Langotsky. He was born in Israel, and nowadays he lives in Berlin, Germany. Elam is a somatic coach and attention management trainer with 30 years of experience in working with clients. Next to his extensive training in embodiment, he has an academic background in intellectual history and philosophy of science which he studied in Germany and Switzerland. I got to know Elam when I was taking one-on-one hands-on bodywork sessions with him, and when I started to ask questions about the theoretical basis of his work, we began having long conversations about the intellectual access to embodiment, which has expanded my perspective immensely and brought another level of depth to my work. So, thank you, Elam, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Very mm-hmm. exciting. So I always open with the question, what is it like being your body today or in general? What is the experience of being you? Hmm. Today is a very specific day. Um, It's a very mellow, soft, slightly slow, emotional. It's a memorial day back home and... It always influences even across great distances. So I would say it feels as if the space is warm, soft, and mellow in some form. Mm. And the body is a bit like a bouncing multiple ping pong balls on a network that somehow goes back and forth within, tries to find a good place to contain all these emotions. Mm-hmm. Ah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Hmm. So, for our listeners and um, people who are maybe not familiar with our work, how would you explain what it is that you do? What is body work? What, what is somatic coaching? Also for a potential client, like how would you explain this? What we try to do is to accompany people, to guide people. The most appropriate word might sound strange, but it is to bring them back home. Home means if we strip away our addresses and our bank accounts and our mobile phones and whatever devices we use and our clothes and everything, strip bare. We are living at this bodily home of ours, and we make all kinds of complications with it. So we accompany people to come back home, and on the way they heal, Mm -hmm. on the way they develop, they evolve, they deepen, they they transform. Mm. So the body becomes a bit like an oracle, not of Delphi and not of the gods, but of the universe talking to you about you. 
husband tries to show you your traces back home. So it's a bit like a Hansel and Kettle, this kind of thing. <laughs> and we follow the crumbs, the signs on the road, to bring people back home. And um, we are all slightly homeless in our disembodied culture and civilizations. And this has been around for centuries. And we pass it on from generation to generation. And I hope now things will change. When people don't understand this, what I just said, and they would look at me working, they would look at this person putting their hands or elbows or using their bodies in all kinds of interesting ways under the heading of touch. And definitely something happens to the people that receive it. Movements, breath tremors, trembling, tingling. So there is a lot going on. Visually, I think that it's a very, it's, it's easy to misunderstand what's happening. Mm -hmm. It's still mysterious. It's still magical. Mm -hmm. But the real thing is how to bring your mind back to your body and to remind both of them that they are one and to give them the way how to regain and reclaim the feeling that we are one, I call it embodiment. Mm -hmm. And to be able, like salmons, to go back home upstream to the sources of where we came from. And those forces at the beginning, at the very, at the very root of everything, is non-duality. This magical of existence, being aware of itself, and being fascinated with itself and with its surroundings. And this is often also what happens in sessions. People sometimes say, whoa, this is trippy. <laughs> <laughs> I say, I didn't, I didn't give you anything to smoke. You know? <laughs> so, and did you put something in the tea? People <laughs> exactly. sometimes ask tea. me. <laughs> That's a dangerous one, but no, I don't. <laughs> so using touch, we are being coached in an interactive way with the person we work with to find a way that they can feel themselves again, they can re being reborn, reawoken to who they are as a living body. Mm -hmm. If I may, just to make one thing clear, when we say the word body, we many times, because of the language, already have a built-in misunderstanding. So we think of the body as something material, and mm -hmm. practically something dead, that is just minerals and stuff, and some cells that are still alive working in there. So we look at the body as a very physical box-like thing that we happen to live there. So mm -hmm. one of the things we do is guide people to to wake up with our embodied perception and to start to see the body not as a box and not as stuff and not as material, not as chemical, not as physical, but as a happening, as a realm where we are now happening as aware creatures, as perceptors, perceivers, where actually we are now manifesting this tissue that the body is is actually your and mine, our manifestation of who we are at this particular moment. And it's changing constantly. So we are also a mystery to ourselves. This is the place where we guide people back home to. So say if people come with a pain or with a certain limitation and we learn to bring the attention and the perception to bear on this area, it's like you illuminate the area with an extra magical light, you can say. And this starts to transform the experience. Later on, we can go into details. Mm -hmm. This is actually what we do. So we use the fact that we are perceptive creatures for all kinds of purposes, because this is ours to, to have. So we can direct it in whichever way. So if it's a headache, it's a headache. Mm -hmm. If it's a muscle tension, it's a muscle tension. If it's a lot of fear and panic locked in your diaphragm, we go there. The idea is to bring back the agent, the person, 
to be present in their unfolding experience. Mm -hmm. And that's where the magic happens. It's like you come back home, but wow, what a home is it? <laughs> mm -hmm. What a home it is. You mentioned in the beginning that we create all kinds of complications in this relationship with our body or in while being our body. And I think with the with the headaches and the and the fear and the diaphragm, you now mentioned examples of what this complications could look like. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit on what What are those complications? Why, why do we get entangled in them? Maybe also, and this opens another door already, um, why it, it is complicated to stay embodied, why it's not the natural state to, to just be and float about happily, um, but to, to get complicated. <laughs> yeah, it does get complicated. And it's a, it's a wonderful question. Why shouldn't it actually be easy? Mm -hmm. Because we have all these millions of years of evolution and 200,000 years of human evolution, specifically in our species, to prepare us actually to have a wonderful body that can enjoy itself and live. Mm -hmm. And somehow this is not the case. It's a huge topic, but if we take just example, yeah, okay, and I leave aside now a huge topic about how the entire culture became complicated mm -hmm. and disembodied, how the entire civilization sort of derailed its embodied experience systematically. So this we can see how we get there. But what people live with, the most common thing is that We have experiences in life, and it's extremely intense. You can see this with children, with toddlers, how emotions can burst from one second to another, what a powerful will they have, and how quick everything happens. It's, this is the intensity of, uh, of a living human being. I don't think even dog, dogs, puppies do this so intensely. Mm -hmm. We do. Now, it was beautiful to hear to one of the talks that you had on the podcast how they it was described how children learn and how they code meaning on experiences. So experiences by themselves could be painful or pleasant, can be intense or a bit more calm, but they are coded with another layer, which is extremely important. So the, the layers that we start to put on them don't only code the feeling it also coded codes an entire meaning that could be for instance this thing should never happen again and then i close a door so if this door is in my body for instance uh, i get angry i kick with my legs on the floor this should never happen again legs should never kick And we start to create little rules for ourselves. And children do this. In sometimes in very consequential way, they really stick to it. I should never ta ta, -ta. So some of us carry it from childhood. Some of us carry it later on as teenagers. Nowadays it can be also older ages. But we come to a point where we shut down certain systems. Sometimes it's even in the nervous system. We can shut down part of the vagus nerve, for instance, and start to create tensions and blockages. Um, and we do this in order to manage very difficult experiences that we don't know how to deal with. We used to think in the past that it's all about emotions. And uh, I would say it's a little bit more varied. But there is a lot of things regarding experiences that are extremely difficult for us to handle. And then it's almost like taming a beast, taming a horse, taming an animal. We learn that this thing should never be. You tie the bad one to the wall. Or this, you should never come close to something because this is too dangerous. Those kind of things. 
and we end up as adults with many areas that are cordoned off. You're not allowed to go anymore in. It's like a scene of a crime. You know, those movies with the red and white <laughs> tapes. So you cannot go in because this is a scene of a crime. Don't disturb. And then we have more and more and more of them, and it starts to be a very limited space where we can actually move freely move. And then we start to feel many times secondary pains. If I'm not allowed to shake my, ha- my head or to go wild with screaming, I will start closing the door already in my neck and then in my shoulders. And it could be that down the line I come with shoulder pain and ask for, for a treatment or for a session because of my shoulders. And then the body starts to tell us, mm, yeah, shoulder is just the beginning. Actually, you have something with self-expression, with anger, with a need to, to say something, even if it's not now, but you feel like it's an old thing that you must say it finally. Those kind of things, the body starts to unravel, literally. It's unbelievable. And the stories the bodies tell us are so surprising because imagine that you know the anatomy or the physiology or certain information about the body. Even imagine that you know the meridians and the connection of how the energy manifests in the body. Suddenly you have a person that has an entirely personal history written in her body that doesn't match any of the normal ways of understanding anatomy, physiology, or meridians, or whether it's alternative, conventional. It's a personal thing. So for this personal person, sorry, the personal coding goes beyond our normal understanding. This is precisely when we have to use attention, perception, and body work. And that's why the techniques will go only so far. There is a need to be attentive also on the behalf, on the part of the practitioner, and also on the part of the client to start to understand, wow, actually I'm dealing here with something that is very uniquely mine. We tend to think that everybody is the same. The word fame is dead. When it comes to the body, nothing is the same. So, out the window. And different examples can be given for how this works. And, we, and people do also tricks for themselves. Because sometimes, if I close a certain door and I can manage better in this environment because they don't like people that do this and this and that, I can start to mobilize myself towards a certain career, a certain way of being, certain communities, starts to become much bigger than just the symptom. It becomes a way of life. And vice versa. <clears throat> when the person starts to change, suddenly they don't fit anymore into this cozy couch where they used to sit, to sit and in this house we don't shake our legs when we are getting angry. Ah, everybody agrees. There is a constitution. Suddenly your legs start to get very nervous and you get back the feeling of your body and you become a disturbance to the peace. Those moments are very interesting because they start to resonate with, whoa, actually, who am I? Many times I have this in session, like, what's happening? And I have to tell people, you are happening. (laughs) And then they start to live with this as if new person, gradually emerging, coming out of the closet in all kinds of ways and emerging to be who they actually are. And it's a very, very surprising thing. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of doing this through through the body is that the body is extremely unique. It's very personal. It's very authentic. It doesn't need to fake anything. And it also doesn't go on the expense of anybody because nobody's like you. There There was not even a competition because what should we compete on who is more you, me or you? Of course, there is no chance for this. And so the whole competition about how to be starts to slip off. It's not interesting. And you start to have very interesting personalities that they start to speak their mind and be who they are. And it doesn't disturb. It doesn't, it doesn't look like it comes on the expense of anybody else or that you have to compete with somebody on being them. It's a, it's a very different world. Mm-hmm. And I am very curious about this world. One of the, of the reasons why I want to speak with you 
from the beginning on was to see how can we bring those insights to the culture, to the public, to a new audience, to people that are not even interested in coming for sessions. But the important that they will understand there is another way to be. And as humans, when we look into this, we are embodied. We are attentive. We are perceptive. And yet each of us is doing it in such a unique way. What would this bring to my office? What would this bring to my school? It doesn't have to be necessarily body work as a, as a methodology. It's human work. It goes in any way, in any place where humans are active. And the benefits are huge. It can reduce so much friction, so much difficulty, complications. Mm -hmm. And gradually people can learn this as an art, as a form of being self-expression. This is actually what I am really interested in. So, of course, 30 years, and I'm dedicating my life in the next 30 years as well, to work with people one-on-one, -on -one, and yet the, the vision of what I see happening in this room where we are, where I work, to bring it out and to allow people to benefit from this even if we never meet, or if they do something completely different. This is actually the proof of that because it means that if we really manage to learn embodiment for ourselves and we really learn to be attentive as we wish and perceptive as we choose we have to take it to our own lives this is our own way it doesn't have to look like a methodology of someone it's nature you don't need to brand it it comes before before you do your yoga or your qigong, or dancing, if you are able to be embodied, attentive, perceptive, everything you will do will be better. And you will do it in your way. Like, how can you beat that? And then when people learn this, and they start to deal, for instance, with the pain, shoulder pain, or so on, and they start to feel, wow, this tells me about myself in so many more levels than just symptomatic level. Then I say, yes, we managed. <laughs> we open a door to this infinity that you are. Our friendship began when I asked you, like, so why does this work? How does it work? I can perceive that it does. I've witnessed it many times, yeah, that when we bring our attention to the body, that things start to transform. It's as if a uh, law of nature. Mm -hmm. And there's the saying that where attention goes, energy flows. And it's definitely true. Um Like when, when you pay attention to your own body and especially when someone else brings their attention, puts a hand. And, and I asked you, like, it does work, but why does it work? So what is at work here mm -hmm. that creates transformation or that creates also the interesting sensations that we then experience, like the tingling and the vibrating <laughs> and the... <laughs> <laughs> the whole shebang. <laughs> the whole shebang. Yeah. And, and then you started to lay this out for me, like what your insight was into this yeah. so far. And yeah, would you, would you be willing to lead us into this field again? Yeah, happily. And um, it's true. This is very much the, you, you, in a way, you perceived something very correct. That when attention goes, energy flows, let's say in the body. Or we can use attention for embodiment in order to, for the energy to flow and to start to heal. So on top of the touch, the techniques, everything we know, there is the person from the inside starting to engage in being attentive to herself. And herself, self is a bad word, but to her experience as a living body and to mobilize her resources. 
This is actually the most powerful condition for healing. If, by the way, it's a powerful condition for everything. Mm -hmm. But for healing, I think it's very, it's very much necessary because without it, the person needs to come again and again and again and again and again because they cannot do it alone and they don't know that they are able to do it alone. And maybe the practitioner doesn't even realize that it can be taught. So it creates dependency. Okay, so I am very much about empowering people and giving them the tools that they can take themselves at home or ready to the next step. Mm -hmm. So what are we talking about? And, and here we come to the triad of the foundation of human experience. We are embodied, absolutely true. Now I think gradually the mainstream of humanity starts to realize that we are embodied. It was not easy to accept. And we are in the process of assimilating this. But if now you, me, everybody listening to us, if you sense your body now, the body is a word, the richness of your experience, the sensation of the chair, the sensation of your socks, the back of your head, the hair, what you do with your hands, all this together, including your visceral, your embodied experience in your you know, organs, your proprioception, interoception. What happens in you now is like an Amazon jungle. <laughs> it's rich, it's wonderful, it's juicy, it's sexy, it's full of life. And kicking, by the way, there are things moving enough, bacteria and cells, and there are all kinds of computer games fighting, and <laughs> boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Who will survive this next virus and who will manage this bacteria? Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a whole life. We are an ecosystem. Now, in normal everyday life, if we now pay attention to it, there is just so much that we can sense. Usually it's around the eyes, face, hands, and parts that are engaged in activities. So the embodied aspect is narrowed down to certain areas that we usually pay attention to. We can say that the body is a latent level of awareness. It's sleeping. It waits. If somebody comes and touches my shoulder, I will turn back. I feel my shoulder, but I'm not paying attention to it. Is it for a potential? Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a potential that is constantly on call, standby mode, ready to whatever happens. People feel it in their little toe when they bang it against the door. You know these experiences? <laughs> and then you really wake up, you definitely have a toe. <laughs> you, five minutes before you, you think about it. Those, those experiences, this is actually what our bodies do. And it's good that they do this, because we don't have time. We are not yogis constantly in perfect meditation to send every cell of our bodies. We have agendas, we have stuff, we have jobs, we have children, dorms, whatever. So the body is in a form of being a potential awareness, latent form of awareness. And this awareness is already alive. It's already functional. Usually, unless we are sick, there is circulation and innovation and everything is there. What attention does? Attention is able to mobilize resources that are not just local to the area. Like my, my elbow can have an elbow awareness. When I want to pay attention to my elbow, I bring more resources from elsewhere. My mind, my brain, my breathing, muscles around it are moving it. I'm starting to be engaged. And it's not just the elbow alone. I bring something extra. Let's say that attentive awareness that is focused, local, temporary, we cannot do it forever, starts to be mobilized to serve a particular need in the body. It can be pain, it can be sickness, it can be a symptom, but it can also be that you're doing a wonderful yoga stretch and you reached your limit, and now you have to pay attention, bring rests, 
force and slow awareness to the area to open even more to go beyond your borders. This is attention. It's localized. It's in short duration. It's intentional. It comes with your will, which means that you are engaged. And it comes as a second layer. It's like an investment. When we invest attention, the area of the body starts to get an extra boost of awareness, energy flow. This is what we need to do in, in healing. And for us, it shortens the distance because the person becomes a full-fledged partner. We can work with them. Then a lot of things start to change. What stands in the way is that people don't often are even aware of the option that I can pay attention of my own accord, my own will. They don't believe that it can help because it feels as if it's a mental thing. People forgot, but the tension is not mindful or mindfulness, not as a school, but as a power. Attention is embodied. Animals have attention. Okay? Attention is embodied. It speaks with the body that is, of course, embodied. And those two start to mobilize their resources in order to get better. So you have a double effect. Attentive awareness on top of latent awareness. This is already starting to give a big boost. Now, the third layer, the, the third hero of the story, and it's the really big one, is perception. With perception, it's not just that attention is involved with the body. With perception, I am, as a person, aware. I am aware that I am involved and that I choose. And it's me. Okay, because attention, despite the fact that it's a superpower, it's a bit like an operating system. It can do everything, it can go anywhere. But for a good operating system to operate properly, I want also to engage a smart user. This is where me as a perceiver, where I step in. And then people start to have, ah, okay, I, I do the attention thing, it's intentional. I bring a second layer of attention. But me as a user now, I am engaged. I find it interesting. I want to get better. What can I do? And I'm starting to be responsible. This is, you can say, this is where the person starts to be engaged as an agent. Okay? We, the word agent is a bit funny. It sounds like insurance or something. <laughs> but in the body, to be an agent means that you have the, your grip your will starts to be expressed and you drive this experience. You own it. So we can even speak about the agent but also about the sovereignty. We have a sovereign nation and I am a sovereign individual. This is my little kingdom, my body. So when I go in and I manifest there and I start to move, I have now three layers of awareness. My perception, my attention, and my body. And this becomes like a cone. And it's very interesting. If people consider this seriously, and that's why I'm saying it's a percept, it's not a concept, if you look anywhere around with your eyes, you will see that you might have a focal point, but you have like a cone of attention on the periphery of that focal point. It's like a road that leads you there. This perspective is a structure of our awareness, integrated so we have the body, the area, we have attention zooming in, we have perception funneling those resources. And this is like laser. It goes to this area and it starts to do something by mere perceiving it, by mere attending to it. And this is amazing. Many times the change has already happened by us watching. It's almost like quantum mechanics nowadays. You say, oh, when the experimenter is engaged and prepares a specific sort of that experiment, the particles, suddenly the subatomic particles, they suddenly play different. Like they are somehow influenced by the fact that somebody is watching. It's like little children. They, they do differently, different things when you don't watch them. When you watch them, whoa, now they got it because they know that somebody is watching. <laughs> Something very similar happens with the body. 
you go to a pain, consider a pain a bit like a crying baby. Mama or Papa come into the room, they start to pay attention, the crying might get louder, but something starts to happen. And in the body, when we do this, the, the sensation almost immediately starts to change. You come back home, you are attentive. You own the experience, you are perceptive. You are focused, something starts to move. Now, <laughs> the tricky part about this is that this little bastard might wake up again to tell you to come back home because he <laughs> likes you, which is fair enough because the body wants to be one, like a family. Yeah, They don't want Papa to go to work or... So they don't like the babysitter, <laughs> whatever. So they cry again, please come back, you forgot me. So many people come and they have an improvement in their condition relatively quickly or something is changing. And then it comes again and it requires more, sometimes even more investment. It tells you, look, it was better, but it's not yet over. You know, it's a bit like an angry friend. Tells you, yeah, it's okay, but I'm still angry with you in a little bit. Come soon back, please. Or come to my birthday. Next time, don't forget. You know, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's what the body is constantly doing. It's a bit like a child, but a genius, genius, genius child. So when you give them what they need, and actually what they need is also what you need. It's not separate, huh? We are a little bit cuckoo about this. Oh, why should I invest in this body? Because it's you, you know? I had once an old person in Tel Aviv. He was very lazy and he was, he was very lucky. He, something was with his breathing. I don't remember the, the condition exactly. And he was trying to learn to breathe and he actually enjoyed it. But he, he liked so much to be grumpy <laughs> that he taught me in one of the last sessions when things got really well. I said, yes, okay, but how many years now I have to breathe? <laughs> I told you, well, I, I hope for you. Many, many happy years. It, it's funny, yeah? but this investment goes back to us. Yeah. So when people do this, the body starts to change. And the tricky part is the body starts to respond back to you. It wants you. So then it starts to call you home. It starts to train you. It's a bit like babies are training the parents. The parents try to educate the baby. <laughs> the babies also train the parents. It's a very, it's reciprocal. It works in both ways. It's very interesting. So the body starts to train you. And then comes a wonderful moment in a, in a process, sometimes frustrating for people, that they feel, wow, my back pain or my headache, they, they, they play tricks on me. They, son, they suddenly go, they suddenly come. Many times we have it with knee pain. Knees are very emotional joints. So some, somebody has a big uh, event coming up, knee pain and it's very interesting to see and sometimes they think they really think something is wrong with their knees and they go and check it and everything is okay with the knee and they just relax a little bit and then then the, the pain goes away so it starts to talk to you it starts to talk back and it means that we have a language to learn to hear to to speak with this particular baby <laughs> this particular child mm -hmm. or animal and to see how we can attend to them and how they can attend back to us and, and this is part of learning. It's embodied learning. You can say this is embodied intelligence. And as much as smart we think we are, the body is this, because it's us, and much more that we are not yet aware of. So it's a true genius. And you have a teacher. Yeah, many people say, my, my, my child is my mentor. Mm -hmm. The body is a bit like this. It starts to mentor you. And it has an agenda that usually it's your best interest. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> so exciting. I get really, really excited when we talk about this. <laughs> I want to um, I want to give two examples, maybe also for this for this ongoing dialogue in a way, because I came to this work because of my back, because mm -hmm. I was in a lot of pain. I couldn't stand upright at the worst times. This is when I discovered this work. And when I tell the story, at some point people always ask, so now you're pain-free? Mm. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I am. <laughs> Most of the times I am. 
This is wonderful. Yeah, but not always. The pain does come back, and it can also be frustrating. And I'm and I'm I'm also, I believe that there is still room for improvement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But in a way, like you said, it's it's also my back is educating me, mm -hmm. and it's an ongoing relationship, which is kind of a little bit twisted to say I have a relationship with my back because obviously I am my back, but you know, <laughs> uh, language. So there is there is this ongoing dialogue yeah. where and and I don't and I no longer perceive it as um, something bad I need to fix exactly, but I perceive it as a valid message mm -hmm. that something is off and it might be that I haven't moved in a while and my my back is frustrated and just needs the good workout mm -hmm. that is definitely a, a relevant layer. Mm -hmm. But there are other layers that my back will on like ongoing. My back will be frustrated if I suppress my power. It will not at some point stop to be frustrated about this. Mm -hmm. So whenever I repress my power, my back will sound an alarm. Yes, and sometimes it's not what we think. Like reason of pain, I did a false movement or yeah. I bent too much. Mm -hmm. Sometimes too little. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it tells you, hey, I want more of you. Yeah. And the relationship metaphor, of course, for the body, it's a bit funny to say I have a relationship, but it's ongoing communication and also ongoing mutual challenging. Mm -hmm. Anyway, our organs are talking to one another all the time. Yeah. So the conversation is going on. Yeah. It's okay. It might not be verbal, but it's full of life. Maybe they also complain about one another, you know, <laughs> the liver says something to the kidney and so on, <laughs> like a family. But um, it's, it's very true what you describe, that the, there is an ongoing dialogue and it starts to train you and you can listen to it, but you also listen to it open-minded. You don't try to mm -hmm. have a theory about why, mm -hmm. you really listen. Yeah. And, and many times it's like a friend or like a lover, they want more of you. Yeah. And nowadays we are really away, it's called. Yeah. We are not there because yeah. of all kinds of things. So it calls us back and sometimes it cries harder. Yeah, and yeah, definitely. And another example that I would that I would like to make is um is chronic illness. Mm -hmm. I've I've been um researching a lot about endometriosis, mm -hmm. which is a sometimes incredibly painful uh, physical condition many, many women suffer from. And what I found out about it is that it requires ongoing attention. Even if you have a breakthrough in the treatment and suddenly the symptoms change radically, if you don't keep investing attention, mm -hmm. it will come back. Interesting. And it's what I heard many doctors also um, confirm that even if people have as if a miracle healing mm -hmm. experience or episode, or or episode mm -hmm. if you then think it's done and you drop it, mm -hmm. it will come back. Yeah, and that's where the relationship with a person is so similar. Mm. Because you make up with a friend, but you forgot them again, Yeah. so they will get hurt again. Yeah. Um, th this is the kind of thing that happens here. But what you touch upon is even deeper than that. If I may just Please. bring a little, few little steps that m will make people understand what we are doing and why it's so important in a, in a snap. Okay, so when people were sick in the old times, they needed a healer. This was gradually institutionalized in in hospitals or in clinics. Okay? It's, by the way, it's quite recent development. Mm -hmm. okay? A few hundred years. Now, this was opening the door for all the different practices of therapy. So we moved from healing, which was more traditional, to therapy that was a little bit more organized and uh, institutionalized. In the 60s of the last century, 50 years ago, so the, um, with the new hippie culture, it is still going on in different variations of it, there was coming a new aspect of learning 
So you're not just healed, you're not just being better through therapy, you learn to be involved. It has something to do with who you are. You become a student of your body. This is, by the way, still around. A lot of what we do still goes into the motion or movement or development or revolution from healing to therapy, from therapy to learning. But here comes the next thing. I sense, I feel, again, very intuitively, I hope I'm not wrong, that we are in, in, a, in the next phase of this development. We need to look at something beyond just learning. If I look at myself as a sovereign, as an agent, as a person who owns my body, who attends to my body, who is that body, who goes into a relationship with certain conditions and symptoms and needs to pay attention on an ongoing basis, it's not just learning a skill. For instance, to contract your muscle, to relax your muscle, to move your muscle, to do an exercise, to do a training, whatever it is, it's still learning. But if we start to see the next development, we are on a journey that is a personal unfoldment through that body, with all the history of that body, with all the history of the species of that body, of the ethnic group of that body, of the DNA treasure of that body, of that ethnic nation, this family, the, the whole trail that manifests in us as a body goes through this evolution that is extremely unique because there is only one like that. <laughs> and you are the only one that can really be there as if 24 hours a day around this creature that becomes you, that you become it, that you develop together. In other words, this is, it leads us to a journey, a perceptual journey, that I could equate with the process of initiation. It starts to become a spiritual journey that I meet my fears, for instance, a bit like the, the Batman story. I feel my fear as a child and then I meet it as an adult and then I meet it as a warrior. And I, I, I come across stations of my developments and I go through them and I evolve further, and I'm still carrying parts of it, and it's still part of an ongoing journey. We need this awareness, and this is why it's so important also to have those conversations that people start to understand what we are dealing with. The body is not just a thing that you can consume, put in a drawer, put to sleep, go through the motions of throwing it to the shower, taking it to the sauna, feeding it with yogurt, take it to the, to the toilet. Like People think of it almost like a caretaker of, a, of an old person. This is not what the body is going to be allowing you to do. And I think they're going to get more and more angry as I'm demanding as we go along. You are on a journey, and this tissue, this universe, I would say it even bluntly, the part of the universe that is you is your body. This is your pekale in Yiddish. This is your little bundle. Hmm. This is what you take with you for a lifetime. And this is you are going to give it away when things are getting ready and you move on. This is your journey. And this is how the body from youth to aging and so on teaches you about you and you are working with it. It is very spiritual. Yeah. And sometimes I meet, for me, for instance, I know that I went through experiences Certain places in my body uh, showed me that certain stories are not finished and there is trauma or there is terrible things that happened. That I go there again and I meet them again, but I also meet them again as a, as a more evolved human being than when I was yep. before. This is the initiation we go through. Yeah. We used to do it in the old times with magicians and shamans and all kinds of rituals, because it was belonging to the tribe. We used to be a collective once, and we should be collective again. But <laughs> each one of us is now a person, and we have our own initiation through 
And many times you see the pains and conditions, they are training us, they take us through this journey. And they call upon us to, de to develop, develop our attention, to be able to be there. Doesn't surprise me, I didn't know this specifically about endometriosis. Yeah. But I would say in general, this is what the body asks us for. And it's very smart. And we have to really be nice with it, because it's not greedy. It doesn't come to dominate anybody. Mm. The, the body doesn't have the energy to, to manipulate. Mm. It just needs a little hug. Okay, <laughs> enough. After two minutes, I can, I, I, will do and I will do the dishes. Okay. It's not milking you. It's not squeezing you. It's not mm. manipulating. It doesn't have the energy and the intention for that. It doesn't mm. work. Mm. These are crazy ideas that we invented. It's not yeah. in the body. So this is another aspect of looking at the, at the revolution going on from healing to therapy to learning to initiation. And I, and I hope in the, in the future it will pick up that the mainstream of culture will start to see the body as who they are, as their Zen koan. It's almost like a riddle. Who are you really? We don't know. We are something that we are still mysteriously awkward or find awkward it's crazy this is who we are and as this thing unfolds we evolve with it i think this will frame the entire embodiment and perception story in the right perspective for the future talk about initiation and these three layers of perception or like the latent awareness, the potential of awareness that we are, mm -hmm. that is in our whole body, then the directed attention that we can manage by our will, and then the perceiving layer where I can perceive how this is happening and unfolding and I'm, it's as if moving behind veils or pulling away the curtains, one curtain after the other. And to like to to see the first you see the uh, the puppets and then you <laughs> see the puppet master and then you I don't know what you then see, but you know like the mm -hmm. as if more you move outwards or inwards it can can be described in both directions i think layer by very layer very interesting what you're saying it it brings us to another little thing here concerning the mm -hmm. direction it's like a russian doll these babushkas yeah exactly i would say that with the body we have a very tangible present manifestation of who we are we just forgot that it's us so we have this it's a bit like a puppet but it, it it's felt it's in the space You see it, you smell it, you move it, you touch it. When we come to attention, it's not felt in the same way, but you can somehow get the feeling of where, what the person pays attention to, and you can feel what you pay attention to. And here comes the thing. It actually starts to work backwards. It works towards you. Yeah. Coming back home can have this physical layer of the body that we call body, the attention where we start to feel it a bit more personal, because I direct it, and then there is the me. I start to work backward to the agent, to, to the person, to the perceiver, what I call. Those layers are opening, but they open backwards. In, in the world, we usually go to see, for instance, galaxies and then other galaxies, and mm. we move into different eons of time. We have now the James Webb that changes the entire universe as we understand it. This is going from near to far. And this is usually how we used to do things in the Moderna. Okay? We have instruments that can see very, very far. When I now start to come back home, it's the other direction. I start to feel my body, I pay attention to my attention, and suddenly I am sitting in this body You can describe it as waking up moment or enlightenment in certain cases. I mean, the here and now, what people often say, I feel all the three layers recalibrating into one. 
and I have a body and I have an attention and I, I perceive my thoughts being formulated and I'm fully in the moment. It's a flow even if nothing much is moving. Mm -hmm. This waking up moment is where the, all these pieces, as much as they can now, sit well together, even if it's for a short time. This is the magic. Now, why is it so important? We tend to use everything like a working tool. Homo habilis. Yeah? We used to be a little creature, the ancient times, that makes tools. We love making tools, like toothbrush, screwdrivers, and cars and stuff. Until today, we are manufacturing species. The problem is that we can have the same attitude towards the body. Okay, so for instance, fingers or toes, even in Latin they call them phalanx. It's the soldiers, it's the foot soldiers. So they become your soldiers. Mm -hmm. They're not you. Wow. Okay, you are, the you are the general, mm -hmm. but you sit there and somebody mm -hmm. does the work. Our, our, we look at the body as a tool, so we have organs. Organs are basically, the word is tool. Soon we will come to the punchline of this, this said joke. But it's, it's, it's very important to understand. Now, when I work with my hands, and when I look at my hands as objects, I instrumentalize my hands. So now my hand does exactly what, let's say, a fork or a ply should do. I just do it with my fingers. I start to treat my body, and later on the tools around my body, I can extend this into a working instrumentalization process. What happened in embodiment, and this is so important, and very rarely do we come to speak about this, is we have the reverse process. That we start to sense the hand, let's say, or the eye, or other organs we use a lot, not just as a tool, not by what they can perform. They can perform wonderful things, no doubt. But by how do they feel as you, this hand is now you. That's what I'm trying to show to people when they come with a pain or with a condition. This condition is you. Listen to you. And then we start to open the door. So from the instrument, we go back to the owner, you can say, of the instrument. And, here, and this is the punchline. If you mm -hmm. think of yourself as a tool, who is owning you? That's very, very weird. <laughs> Your mind. Your mind. Yeah, so maybe the mind. Okay, now we, you start to scratch. Where is the mind? Mm. You don't really find it. Yep. So we are becoming instruments, a species that produces instruments. If you look all, all around you, you will see tons of instruments. Hello? <laughs> where is the guy or where is the gal that's supposed to, to own this stuff? Where do they reside? And, and then you suddenly realize what happened to us. We speak now about transhumanism, mm -hmm. about looking at something beyond just being human. We already lost this train hundreds of years ago. <laughs> we are deeply unhumanized. You want to call it now transhumanized and to put it with some in vitro possibilities, very interesting, but it's already out. And we have given up, given away, not just now for the in Instagram or the internet or whatever. We have given up on our thinking. I hope we will have a, a talk about that in the future. We have given up about our body as a natural habitat, as an ecosystem. Everything became a tool for something else. Mm -hmm. And this is really something to think about. So when the layers are being uh, unveiled, we go from the body feeling to the attentive awareness to the perceiver. And then we start to wake up. Yeah. If we go the other way, we usually we have a lot of interesting things to do, but they are already leading us off or out. And then we come back to the body. So embodiment in another way, we can say, is teaching people how to de-instrumentalize their experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how to be able to differentiate between me paying attention to me and me instrumentalizing a part of myself 
to do something. And no doubt, we have a lot of things we need to do. The good balance would be, and this I would say also to a, as a practitioner for my job and my work, that's why I love it so much, if I really want to do a good job with my hand, touching someone, I have to be aware that it's my hand. Yeah. I cannot make it into an instrument. Yeah. Then the session is dead. So there are professions, I think sometimes even musicians, People, they do things with their hands, that they really feel the art of how articulate their movements are mm. to really get what they want, and they don't just look at it as, as an object or as an instrument. Mm -hmm. That's a very different aspect of it. And I think it also relieves or releases nature from the way we look at it like a slave or like an object of desire into a, the dignity of being that the body becomes dignified again. It's not just a tool. It's not just serving a purpose that is above it. I know that people struggle with identity and the different aspects of how they should express themselves to the world, but if they could do it with more dignity to the body, this poor body, he, it's also she, he, they are also, they need their place to be, not just to be instrumentalized. It's not a commodity. We are still living in a culture that looks at the body as a commodity. It's something we sell and we buy. Yeah. It's something we show or something we hide. And, and by all these steps, we look at the body as if it needs patronage. And yeah, and that influences body. our embodiment deeply. Mm -hmm. Like I really, I, I've noticed it in myself and I've noticed this in with so many clients, like how these implications of society and culture really form our embodiment or how, you know, considering gender, beauty, mm -hmm. strength, mm -hmm. power, mm -hmm. all kinds of layers, like how we almost deform our embodiment to mm -hmm. fit certain standards or yeah. it's not just that I suck my belly in to appear slimmer, which is like definitely a relevant layer for many, many people, but even more like avoiding to feel your genitalia or, you know, like trying to not show your breast or, and like no matter what your gender is, mm -hmm. no matter what your sex is, this like this influences everybody so deeply. And I think yeah. it's a, you know, we're almost circling back now to the beginning of like what creates complications. Like this is definitely... Yeah. creates a lot of complications that yeah. we that we put these ideals on top of people and on top of bodies especially yeah and it's forced and pushed on the body by force yeah absolutely this is a huge topic and it touches more the sociology or the mm -hmm. anthropology or the cultural studies the body is nature and the body is culture The body is an object that culture can work on, from diapers <laughs> to clothes to punishments to things. And the body is part of nature. It's not just a social contract, construct. This is madness to see it only as a social construct. It has millions of years in the making. So we are both. This is the magnificent part of being a body. Now, when we start to recognize that the body is nature and we find that we are, as a culture, dominating the body, sometimes there is no other choice. You have to dress when you go out to the street. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's very nice to do it in certain parts of the world differently, <laughs> but we cannot do it here. You have to get dressed. You don't like getting dressed. I understand. So we have to find a certain level. But this natural being when it starts to be pushed around and forced and twisted and carry all those scars and be punished by not liking you or by hating you or whatever it is, but looking at you as not an attractive person and so on, we start to work on the body and we start to torment it, to break it. And the results are catastrophic. And the people that live this body The people that are both nature and culture, they don't know how to go about this. Many times they become like an object of intervention. Mm -hmm. 
and they don't know how to undo the processes. This is part of what we try to do in processes here, to learn to liberate, emancipate, and power backwards for the body to be itself. Yeah. Without the opinions of how it should, this is the place that sometimes people get stuck. We are so polarized that people just s scream at one another. If the body can be just talk talked into being itself, it starts to show us what is its nature, mm -hmm. not what is put on top of it. Mm -hmm. It's not an opinion. Mm -hmm. It's nature. And this is part of what we try to, to create in those sessions and the processes that people start to have a piece of nature that goes with them, yeah. this oracle. Yeah. And they yeah. can start to have even more information. I feel this place is not good for me, so I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to leave this party. Thank you. Bye-bye. Absolutely. Bye. And the goal is not that they come to you every time they have a question, but that they can come to themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, not that they need the practitioner to tell them what to do or to find the solution, yeah. <laughs> or even not even showing them within themselves where the solution is, but to really empower them that they, that they can learn to perceive themselves in this way and, um, and, and as if learn the language that the body is speaking, engage in the dialogue with the body. And this is precisely what I claim that there is a missing foundation in our learning. Mm -hmm. Before we start to learn cognitive learning, like yeah. numbers and symbols and methods, we have to learn how to be embodied. Yeah. We have to learn how to be attentive and we have to learn how to be perceptive. This is the embodied intelligence at the root of all the other multiple intelligences. Mm -hmm. This is the me mega operating system. <laughs> and this is how you learn to be you yeah. before all these influences start to crush you down. Absolutely. And they should not come to anybody. By the way, it's very funny. Sometimes I find myself telling people I work with, nobody should tell you how you should live. Including me. If you catch mm -hmm. me telling you how you should dress or how you should live or what you should <laughs> believe in, please wake me up, mm -hmm. throw some bucket of water over my head, because I went nuts. Mm -hmm. This role of giving people orders of how they should be. Wow. Even their wives or their husbands will tell them how they should live their lives. Yeah. And they, you go back to the source. By the way, the body is coming from, from the universe, mm -hmm. from the earth. So when you go back to the body, it's not just even subjective. You go to the body, you go to the source. You go to Mother Earth, this little piece that is you. You consult with nature. Yeah. It's nature that is you. It's yeah. beautiful. Okay. And you still bring part of your culture, but you still see something in this nature, in this double image of both nature and culture, and the way that you navigate yourself as a very unique being unfolds your way and nobody went there before because nobody was there before there was no you before <laughs> so <laughs> there is something there that naturally becomes a surprise and that's why I can do this now for another 30 years without feeling bored yeah like I could combine this with with the workshops and stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, or courses or in the future hopefully there will be places where people can learn this mm -hmm. but it's this it Mm -hmm. about it that mm -hmm. makes me completely hooked mm -hmm. and I've seen so many surprising things mm -hmm. that I said like, wow maybe there is hope for humanity <laughs> oh. and it's not necessarily a new ideology it's actually coming back home to this yeah. cosmic home that we are yeah. beautiful that's a uh... That's an optimistic note to end <laughs> on, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I really, I really also want to add that since we started our conversations, part of them we recorded there on YouTube if people are interested, mm. um, but we also had many conversations that we didn't record. Um, it changed the way I work, and I don't only mean work with clients, it changed that too, but also... For example, how I create this podcast, mm -hmm. how I think about the work, how I write about the work, um, that I really feel that simply by understanding these different layers of perception, of awareness, attention, perception, 
um, it already started to change my cognition in a way that I feel my mind is much more silent. I feel I can silent it by will if I need to, like to create silence, to focus more on things I wish to focus on, to rest better if I need to. Like really I feel like the that the the dialogue I am having with my body became so much richer and differentiated. Um, yeah, I'm really grateful for this. Well, amazing. And for me, it really strengthens, again, the belief or the trust. Hmm. Belief is a problem. problem <laughs> where, but the trust in that there is a way there that bodies know. Yeah. That you, you can really trust to give them the tools and gradually beautiful. And that's why I think I say also that it's so important to bring it to the audience, to the public. People can benefit from those things independently of issues or problems or symptoms or conditions. Yeah. But to evolve like or to yeah, not only to heal but then to move on from there basically. Yeah, exactly. And it moves from Therapy or learning or healing into creativity. And this, if this could ever become a form of learning that we can teach young people, I think it will change the course of humanity. Yeah, I think it's already starting to happen. Mm -hmm. I know, I know many, by now I know many people involved in this revolution. <laughs> cool. That's a good sign. Yeah. Cool, so thank you for having me, it was super interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you everybody for listening. To find more about Elam and his work, you can check out his website, which is elamatwork.com. And Elam is spelled E-Y-L-A-M, Elam, elamatwork.com. And for now, I wish you a very differentiated and caring conversation with your body and that you feel at home in yourself and in the world. And if you enjoy this podcast, I'd be so happy if you liked, shared, followed, subscribed, recommended it to your friends. See you again in two weeks.